So um, for those who don't know me, I am John Paul Rice. I worked in Hollywood for the last 22 years in filmmaking. I got my start in Remember the Titans as a football player in that movie. I was an extra, but a Titan football player extra that was all over the movie, working with Denzel Washington and all the young stars, including Ryan Gosling. I was around all of them for about a month and a half. We worked every day together, just about. And that set me on a path to away from business, away from marketing, away from sales that I was involved in from the time I was 17 to 20 years old. I had an interest in the arts and I followed my passions out to LA on a dream and ended up finding myself in a place that I did not know would become such a big topic the way it is today. Um, so in short, those 19 years in Los Angeles were spent some as an actor, uh, some as a producer. And then there was the person, John Paul Rice, that he had his experiences as well that were later reflected upon and understood that they were manifestations of his childhood traumas, which is kind of the basis of why Los Angeles and the Hollywood entertainment industry exist in one way, not that they are purposefully for that reason or exist for that reason, but that they draw a lot of that energy into that town. People who have been traumatized in childhood typically, um, you know, move away from that trauma or try to get away from that trauma in most cases. And in my case, I did. I ran away from my family, my life on the other side of the country. Um, I had talent, I had abilities, I had skills. And I ended up making my way through that industry while working at a both production company that did Juno, The Grudge, Harold and Kumar, Stranger Than Fiction. The guy who was my mentor, Joseph Drake, went on to do The Hunger Games at Lionsgate. He's a great guy. He taught me some of the most truest things about the business that you can't learn from a classroom or even working at a production company just to get exposure to the industry. He taught me very deep things. Um, as a man, I got into my craft and my profession by a series of misfortunes, really. I had, at 25 years old, this is, and believe me, I wasn't like on every cover, so don't, don't think I'm embellishing myself as some like, you know, hotshot protege. But at 25 years old, after having been out there only three years, having not produced any movie, not been, in, I mean, I was in Titans, yes, I was in a Mel Gibson film, yes, but not on the big level, star level. But what had happened to me is that I had an ability early on to discern what is a talented and good script. I met with the producers who did Little Miss Sunshine before Little Miss Sunshine was even made. Um, I read that script, saw how brilliant it was. I read the movie about Schmidt. I saw how brilliant that was. I read the script of Kenzie. There were all these big time films, seminal films, important films and independent films whose scripts I had the chance to read before they were made into movies. And I was even able to discuss them and talk with them in creative meetings. Cause I, cause the company I worked for was so small at the time. There was only like seven, eight people there. And I was answering phones and reading scripts and being part of the creative meetings during the week. Now I wasn't the creative guy, but I had my contribution and we were all in the beginning. We had a mandate to go out and seek out every single rock that we could turn over to get a good project to come in because we had money and we had the mechanism to make it happen. So I got to be a part of that in the marketing, the distribution, the sales, the finance, the production, the creative, and the whole package of that for four and a half years. Then I went into the banking industry and the banking industry that catered to the one tenth of 1% in LA, which was mostly Hollywood, the Bank of the Stars, that kind of thing. I worked in a very technical position there um, without giving all the details away. I ended up being there for 13 years and I was exposed to data and information as a systems administrator in the technical side to provide support. I had to go into the database systems to look at certain files. And obviously not that I was snooping around. I never did any of that shit. I was very respectful of the information I was dealing with, but every once in a while you'd see names of people that are in the news and, that are in your politics and all that. And you can't help because you're looking at a certain field in the screen, seeing the you know realities of the finances that were going on. And you just put that aside. You don't think about it. You don't sit there and contemplate it. You don't sit there and obsess over it. You just go, 
okay, I just saw this person. And then you see a news story and you go, that's totally not true in terms of what they're talking about in money. Now, that's not my world. That's not my call, right? But I started to see a disconnect since 2008 to now, to 2016. And the disconnect was that I saw that during the last financial crisis in 2008 to 2016, that the wealthiest people, when the market crashed, the wealthiest people were buying up homes and properties at a record level because they were getting it for cheap because everybody had foreclosed. And I said, you know what? While that may be true, and that is always true of the wealthy taking advantage of a crisis for the rest of us, it wasn't right. It didn't set right with me. Not that we weren't performing our jobs and our doing, that's how it's all, this is how conspiracy works, folks. I just want to explain to people, everybody is doing their job. There isn't some master plan that everybody's like rubbing their hands around like a Scooby-Doo you know, villain or some evildoer in a movie that wants to take over the world. has got his henchman and his legion. This is the real life stuff that we are living through, which is why there is a collective insanity going on in the world because there is a disconnect from the truth and reality versus what we think is reality. Now, I went through all of that and I come into 2015, 2016, and I had had little glimpses of how the industry started to change. But you're looking at a guy who at 25, I was meeting with people, Harry Potter, the people at, 20th Century Fox, the people at Universal, not the big, you know, heads of the studios, but the, the vice presidents, all the people that made films happen all around town. They could green light something, they could develop, they could package it. Put them. Okay. I had a film that I was going to make for about two and a half, three million dollars. I had 80% of the financing. I had distribution. I had a star attached. And then everything over the course of a weekend began to unwind because that star had a problem and the management team and everybody else was fired and they had to find a new home, you know, with all of the different people. And we were out of the project and the money that had been committed with the distribution was all kind of working in concert with each other. We tried to hold on to it and we said, you know what, we're going to walk away from this. We're going to make a movie because we've been at this for three years trying to get these films off the ground. We've met incredible people who believe we're talented. We need, to, we need to go out and prove it. We need to go out and do it ourselves. So the film that I was gonna make and how much money I was gonna get paid on that one as a salary is the total budget of the first film that I ever did. And I didn't pay myself. I put money into it, my own skin in the game. That was called One Hour Fantasy Girl. It was based on a true story about a young woman who works out of a motel room for $150 an hour in Hollywood, does whatever fantasy a man wants, as long as there's no sex, no nudity, and it's 100% legal. And it, to this day, it is our biggest hit, especially among women worldwide, because it's the truth. It's the truth about the non-sexual, glamorized world, the real girlfriend experience, the real dangerous shit that goes on day to day, and and the nightmare that people live through. And this was a beautiful story about hope, about finding your own inner strength, because the world bearing down on you outside is far more dangerous than the one that you are and the one that you believe you're in. And the truth is, is that it's all about surviving another day, but having hope, a, a movement forward and up. And that was my first movie, and it, 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 it came out the same year as The Girlfriend Experience. I actually had a couple of reviews, especially from women who thought it was a better art movie, even though it was a lower budget, significantly lower budget than a Soderbergh film. They said that this is the real movie. This is the real story. This is the heart gut-wrenching one that you're rooting for her, rooting for her, rooting for her, and hoping she makes it out. And it's, it still to this day plays in over 90 countries, it is one of our best-selling of all time movies. I'm sure men and women go into it with perceptions and then they're pleasantly surprised in the most part. But then that set me on a path to start doing social issue films. Um, and I was a liberal, but as I got more into these topics of child abuse, because um, I did a movie called Memories of a Lost Love, which is one of the most powerful films I made 10 years ago, 
It's a very slow burner, but it deals with child abuse in the home with the parents. And in some ways, the writer director understood that 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 whole movie, not the events that occurred, but the the concepts of it was a mirror into my own childhood. 